He was the most notorious and brutal king that has ever ruled over England, and he's most remembered for his six wives. Henry VIII was a man who changed the face of history forever, as did his wives, but two of them, met a very horrific end inside the Tower of London. But in the years after their deaths, there were many times in which the remains of Henry VIII's wives were exhumed, dug up, and even desecrated by curious individuals wanting to see if the history books were correct. The graves were disturbed, and the earth where they were buried was broken. But also their coffins were opened, and what these people discovered was remarkable. This is opening the coffins of Henry VIII and his six wives. One of the most barbaric and brutal kings of England was Henry VIII, who is best known for having six wives. Two of these lost their heads inside the Tower of London as an axeman and swordsman would perform the bloody roles of taking the heads of his wives. But Henry VIII in his final years put a huge amount of weight on and he would become rather restricted with injuries he had following a jousting accident which transformed his personality. The king had been smashed off of his horse in his thirties and following this he became rather tyrannical and his mood would shift sharply. This coincided with the executions of some of his friends who he would condemn and then regret these actions. But in 1547, Henry VIII became ill early in the year and he would succumb to this inside of his chambers in the Palace of Whitehall. However, Henry VIII following his death would be buried in a very small vault which is not in keeping with his reputation and legacy. Today he still remains in this burial vault despite his wishes being different. However, the vault of Henry VIII would be broken into a number of times and with this the most infamous king of England was disturbed. On the 28th of January 1547, King Henry VIII died, and his death was one which was rather peaceful. He was attended on by the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, and in the end the king slipped away, and he did acknowledge in his life that he had sinned a great deal. But following his death, the king's body was washed inside of his chambers, after it was left a few days before his demise was announced to the Parliament. With this, Edward VI was made king, but Henry VIII's heart and vital organs were removed, and these, it's believed, were then placed in lead caskets or vessels, which were buried in places separate from where his body was laid to rest. After this, the king's body was placed into a coffin, and it was then laid in state in the presence chamber of Whitehall Palace, and was surrounded by burning tapers before it was moved on a huge procession to Windsor Castle and the church within the castle's walls, St George's Chapel. Henry VIII stated in his will to his servants and family that he wanted to be buried with his third wife, Jane Seymour, who had died following giving birth to King Edward VI. Jane's demise inside of Hampton Court was very sad, and she never made it out of the place alive as she became sick in the days following giving birth to the heir. But Jane's death changed history forever, as despite giving the king everything he wanted, if she had recovered, then it's unlikely Henry would have had more wives. But her body, minus the heart, which had been buried in Hampton Court Chapel, was taken to St George's Chapel and was buried in a vault under the floor of the choir, showing her importance but Henry decided that he wanted to be placed to begin with in this vault before he wanted to be moved to a much larger and grander tomb which would be placed inside of Westminster Abbey alongside his father and mother's tomb. The tomb of Henry VIII was planned for many decades before he died and he wanted this to be a large ornamental tomb which would be bigger and grander than his mother and father's. Henry VII and Elizabeth of York Specifically, it would be a quarter bigger, and Italian sculptors tried to work on this, and Henry VIII did argue with them over the tomb's design. However, the king died before the tomb would be finished, and because of this, it was never completed, as his children would not invest a huge sum of money to finish it. But because of this, the king's dreams of being buried inside a grand memorial would never occur. The coffin of Henry VIII after his death and embalming was then taken on a huge procession from Whitehall Palace 
to Windsor Castle. The procession was four miles long and roads had to be widened to allow it to pass by. And the hearse carried the coffin of the king, which was pulled by horses who had been draped in black cloth. But on the coffin was a wax effigy of Henry VIII, covered in jewels and his clothes. This was for many people who witnessed the procession the first time they had seen an image of their king and what he looked like, and the crown was also placed on the coffin. The funeral procession moved towards Sion Abbey, and it was then rested for the evening to have a break, and there have been rumours in the past centuries that whilst it was here, the king's body exploded, and that parts of Henry dripped out of the coffin, and then this was licked at by dogs. This may have been caused by the gases building up in the body after death, and this is known to occur. But after the evening, the journey continued on to the burial site, and the coffin of Henry VIII reached Windsor, and it was then carried into the church by sixteen yeomen of the guard. Such was the weight of Henry's coffin. The funeral service of Henry VIII then occurred, and his coffin was then lowered into the vault where it still remains 500 years on. His officers of the household broke their staves of office and threw these into the vault after the coffin, but the burial vault would, throughout the centuries, be disturbed a number of times. Today there is no pomp or ceremony regarding the king's burial site, and it's just a simple marble slab showing where Henry VIII is buried. It says, In a vault beneath this marble slab are deposited the remains of Jane Seymour, Queen of King Henry VIII, 1537, King Henry VIII, 1547, King Charles I, 1648, and an infant child of Queen Anne. This memorial was placed here by command of King William IV, 1837, but Henry VIII was disturbed a number of times, mostly to bury the others inside of the vault with him, and he would be buried next to someone who he would consider his greatest enemy. The most important person inside of the burial vault after Henry VIII is King Charles I, who was placed next to Henry's coffin. King Charles was a steward, and Henry VIII during his reign would bar the Stuarts from ever becoming the kings of England. But after his daughter Elizabeth I had no children or heirs, the Stuarts became also the rulers of England. But Charles I is remembered in history for being one of the most brutal and shocking kings who threw his country into civil war. The English Civil War is known as the bloodiest conflict ever fought in England, but Charles I would be placed on trial after the defeat and he would then be condemned to death before his head was taken off on Whitehall by an executioner. But because of the furore regarding Charles I and the hostility towards this action, Parliament tried to make sure that they buried Charles I in a quiet place, especially because they were worried that royalists would dig him up and venerate him as a martyr. Because of this, Charles I was quietly buried in Henry VIII's vault, and the vault of Henry VIII was actually rather full with just Henry and his wife Jane in there. When it came to marrying Charles, to get his coffin in, workers had to move Henry's to the side, and it's believed they may have actually damaged this and damaged some of the wood of the Tudor King's coffin. But also another Stuart would be added to this vault, and that was one child born to Queen Anne, the last Stuart monarch, who was buried also at the feet of Henry VIII in a small coffin, this meant that to lay the enemies of the Tudor monarch in the vault, the vault was broken into. But then again in 1813, the vault would be broken into yet again, as building work was being carried out inside of St George's Chapel and the Royal Vault. The builders entered the vault containing the remains of Henry VIII, but then officials went further and they opened the coffin of King Charles I to see what was inside of it and the Prince Regent, the future George IV, also oversaw this. However, they noticed that Henry's coffin was in a bad state and had been broken. The trestle it had been sat on was broken and had collapsed, and this was done when Charles's coffin was squeezed in. The pressure from within the body of Henry was also said to have splintered the wood, and the top of the coffin had allegedly split open. 
but there was no record of any work being done to move Henry into another coffin, which was more suitable, meaning his body may be exposed to the air still today. However, Henry VIII was one of the most notorious and evil kings that had ever ruled England, but he was buried in a quiet place where he did not want to remain forever. He still lies under the floor of the chapel in Windsor, and not in the great tomb that he wanted, but surely his reputation means he deserves a grander monument and tomb than he currently has, as if you visit Windsor today, it is very easy to walk past his burial vault. The first wife of King Henry VIII was Catherine of Aragon, and she is deemed in history to have been very unfairly treated. She was pushed outside in her marriage to the king, as Henry's eyes wandered towards Anne Boleyn, one of her ladies-in-waiting, and Catherine would fight for her status as a queen. Her husband, Henry, demoted her eventually to that of a dowager Princess of Wales, due to the fact she had married Henry VIII's brother, Arthur Tudor, who died inside of Ludlow Castle, shortly after they themselves had tied the knot. But Catherine would have a very tough end to her life, as following being banished from the royal apartments, she was virtually held under house arrest inside of Kimbolton Castle. But what is captivating is that Henry VIII would order a huge tomb for his first wife, who he then hated to be buried. But then this was desecrated. However, 200 years after her death, the coffin of Catherine of Aragon was disturbed and was opened, what those people who did this found was shocking. Catherine of Aragon was a queen who would rule England alongside her husband for some time, and she was the longest standing wife of the notorious Tudor king, but she is buried inside of Peterborough Cathedral today. Which is shocking considering her role in history. It would have been expected that she would have been buried inside of Westminster Abbey, but this is not the case. Catherine died inside of Kimbolton Castle on the 7th of January 1535 at the age of 50. But Henry had a lot of input with regards to the funeral of his first wife, and he would later complain about the amount of money he spent on it. Henry chose Peterborough Cathedral for a number of reasons, as this was relatively close to the place where she died, and he ordered that Catherine should be buried with all of the honours of a dowager Princess of Wales, meaning that she was demoted to the wife of the deceased Prince of Wales, as in the wife of his brother, Arthur. This was a huge disgrace when compared to the work she had done as the Queen. For her funeral, there was a large state procession with many noble ladies there to take part. There was a lot of black cloth provided for the women to wear mourning veils and other garments, and Henry VIII would bemoan the cost he spent on his first wife's funeral, and because of this, he made sure that he did not spend a lot of money on the memorial or the burial. Catherine is not necessarily buried in a grand or ornate tomb, but simply under the floor. More on this shortly. It was said for her burial arrangements that the right excellent and noble princess, the Lady Catherine, daughter to the right high and mighty Prince Fernand, the late King of Castile, and late wife to the noble and excellent Prince Arthur, brother to our sovereign lord, King Henry VIII, and she would be buried with this title. She was now considered the sister-in-law of Henry VIII, and she was not in death referred to as a queen. Her body was embalmed and her vital organs had been removed and buried elsewhere from her body, and preparations were made for the funeral in many ways. Clothing and veils for the mourners and ladies of the household of Catherine were made, and, as mentioned, this cost Henry VIII a lot of money, and for this he complained, and he would then refuse to pay any more, and he kept Catherine's funeral service simple and straightforward. Her procession to the place of burial began at Kimbolton Castle, and the body had been placed in a thick coffin, and her remains inside of this were encased in lead, and they had also, it's believed, placed her entrails in a separate chest. They were wrapped in sear cloth, a thick wax cloth that would preserve the body well. When it left Kimbolton Castle, the procession was large, and the hearse was pulled to Sawtree Abbey, where it rested for the night before it continued on to Peterborough Cathedral, or Abbey as it was known. The coffin of Catherine of Aragon arrived and was carried into the cathedral which had been richly decorated with symbols of the deceased Catherine and the English monarchy. The man who led the funeral service and preached the sermon was John Halsey, 
who would replace the executed Bishop of Rochester, John Fisher. He would preach a sermon with Henry VIII, who had involvement in, and he would tell lies that denounced her, and he claimed that during her final moments Catherine said that she was not a queen and had never been the rightful Queen of England. This was seen as distasteful and disrespectful, and the imperial ambassador Eustace Chapwee, who would have told the emperor about this, was kept away. Henry VIII, following her burial, would create a fine tomb for his first wife, despite the fact he hated her by this point, and he delivered on his promise to give her a decent burial, despite the pro-Anne Boleyn propaganda. Nothing of this tomb remains as during the English Civil War. Parliamentarian soldiers destroyed it and caused chaos inside of the cathedral. However, what is shocking is that in the 18th century, there was an exhumation of Catherine of Aragon's coffin that took place, and her coffin was opened and sadistically tampered with and disturbed. There were no real legitimate reasons to disturb the resting place of a queen who had by this point been buried over 200 years. There had been rumours for many years that Catherine of Aragon was not buried alone, and some believed that she was actually buried with Catherine Willoughby, a prominent Tudor woman who, some believed, could have even become at one point Henry VIII's seventh wife. But this was then investigated, and to do this in 1777, officials inside of the cathedral decided to open the tomb of Catherine. They lifted the flagstones which were under where the tomb had been destroyed, and they opened the grave. The grave was opened and the investigators discovered that there was only one coffin, and this was Catherine of Aragon. There were no other coffins, however, officials decided that to open the coffin would have been disrespectful and unnecessary. However, one of the witnesses took matters into his own hands. He was armed with a drill, and he would place this on the coffin, and he then drilled a hole into the coffin of Henry VIII's first wife. And after this, he slid a wire into the opening he had created, this had a hook on it, and he pulled and hooked a part of the black and silver fabric which Catherine had been buried inside of. He took this part of her clothes from her body, ripping them, and then when he brought the hook out of the coffin to inspect it, he noticed there was a distinct smell of embalming fluid which still remained centuries on. But when the fabric emerged from the coffin, it hit the air and disintegrated and perished. This was the only time that Catherine of Aragon's remains were broken into, and the coffin was then reburied, and in later years, modern tombs have been made for her, with the last being a Victorian one, which links her to being a Queen of England. However, what is bizarre is that the coffin of Catherine of Aragon was drilled into and damaged, and this small hole caused a huge amount of damage to her body. It's believed that as her body was now exposed to the air, that a significant amount of decomposition would have happened to her remains, and that the embalming fluid to keep the former wife of Henry VIII's remains preserved well was in a battle against the elements and exposure. This is a shocking thing that witnesses have caused so much damage, but has never been held accountable for. At the end of her life, Catherine of Aragon was held under virtual house arrest, and she would be banished from royal court by her husband, Henry VIII. Henry's treatment of Catherine in her later life was a stark contrast to the early happy marriage that they had, and he was drawn towards younger women at court who he had his eye on. But Catherine would have her coffin broken into by a curious official who caused a significant amount of damage when visiting Catherine's burial place today. He noticed there is no huge tomb or effigy of her, just a simple slab that marks her site of burial. On the 19th of May, 1536, Anne Boleyn was asked from her apartments inside the Tower of London to come with the lieutenant of the Tower for her execution. There had been a scaffold made on the north side of the White Tower, and this would become the execution platform, where a Queen of England would lose her head. It was groundbreaking and crazy. The thought of the wife of a king being executed for a number of false charges but this was Henry VIII's way of ridding himself of Anne, a woman who attracted a huge amount of controversy. She walked up to the scaffold gracefully, 
and when she got there, she made a short speech to the witnesses that were gathered, she said, Good Christian people, I am come hither to die, for according to the law and by the law I am judged to die, and therefore I will speak nothing against it. I am come hither to accuse no man, nor to speak anything of that, whereof I am accused and condemned to die. But I pray God save the king, and send him long to reign over you. For a gentler, nor a more merciful prince was there never, and to me he was ever a good, a gentle, a sovereign lord. And if any person will meddle of my cause, I require them to judge the best. And thus I take my leave of the world, and of you all, and I heartily desire you all to pray for me. O Lord, have mercy on me. To God I commend my soul." The executioner was a French swordsman, known as the Sword of Calais, and Anne had heard his stellar reputation herself. The swordsman readied himself, and Anne knelt on the scaffold. She did not lay her head on the block. The French swordsman took off his shoes whilst his assistant distracted the queen, and with one clean swing of his sharp weapon, the head of Anne Boleyn was taken clean off. Following the execution... The executioner collected Anne's gown and walked off with this, along with his weapon, and he then began his journey back to France. Whilst this was happening, the ladies-in-waiting that had been appointed to Anne Boleyn while she was in the tower gathered up her body and her head in an oak chest, which had previously been used to house bow staves. They then carried the remains of Anne into the chapel, and the small church next to the scaffold, and Anne was buried in a hastily dug grave with very little pomp or ceremony. However, during the reign of Queen Victoria, a historian in 1848 visited the chapel of St Peter ad Vincula, and he said of this that, I cannot refrain from expressing my disgust at the barbarous stupidity which has transformed this interesting little church into the likeness of a meeting house in a manufacturing town. In truth, there is no sadder spot on earth than this little cemetery. Over the centuries, the chapel had fallen into a bad way, and the constable of the tower, who took the job in 1876, agreed that it was time that important work was to be done to restore the place where a number of queens of England were buried, and also where some of the most influential Tudor figures were also interred. During this work, Queen Victoria stated that she wanted the chapel to be a place which was fit enough to house the remains of queens. The chapel also contained the remains of Henry VIII's fifth wife, Catherine Howard, and when renovation work began on the floor, thousands of bodies were found under it. And it was said that, on removing the stones of the pavement it was found, as reference to the burial register too abundantly proved, that the resting places of those who had been buried within the walls of the chapel during the tribulous times of the 16th and 17th century had been repeatedly, and it was feared almost universally, desecrated. As the Tower of London was not really used as a royal residence or a home for the monarchy any more, the chapel was not looked after, and it was just seen as a normal parish church where locals would come for services each week. Also, a number of local parishioners were buried in the tower alongside Anne Boleyn, and it was said that it is true that the bodies of those who had perished on the scaffold or died as prisoners within the walls of the tower were buried, no doubt intentionally, in some great obscurity. But even if some memorial stone had recorded their burial place, it is doubtful whether that would have protected their remains, for in the instance of the three Scotch lords, Lovett, Balmaro and Kilmarock, although their grave was specifically marked by a stone, which is still preserved, it was found that their bones had been much disturbed, so much so indeed as to be beyond all possible means of identification. It is even feared that in some instances coffins had been designedly broken up and their contents scattered in order to make room for some fresh occupants of the ground. But when the work on the chapel's uneven floor began, the builders would make some remarkable discoveries, including the remains of those men and women who were executed inside of the tower. They then came across the remains of Anne Boleyn. 
The archaeologists exhumed the remains of Anne and they noticed a number of things. First, that this woman's body had been beheaded by a sharp instrument and also that the oak coffin or chest she had been buried in had rotted over the centuries after she was buried. The Professor of Medicine for Queen Victoria, Dr Frederick Mowat, was then summoned to the tower to identify and handle these remains. The body was found at a depth of two feet, and the remains were described as belonging to a female of between 25 and 30 years of age, of a delicate frame of body, and who had been of slender and perfect proportions. The forehead and lower jaw were small and especially well formed. The vertebrae were particularly small, especially one joint, the atlas, which was that next to the skull, bearing witness to the Queen's little neck. He then stated... The bones found are certainly those of a female in the prime of her life, all perfectly consolidated and symmetrical, and belonging to the same person. The bones of the head indicate a well-formed round skull with an intellectual forehead, straight orbital ridge, large eyes, oval face and a rather square full chin. The remains of the vertebrae and the bones of the lower limbs indicate a well-formed woman of middle height, with a short and slender neck. The ribs show depth and roundness of chest. The hands and feet bones indicate delicate and well-shaped hands and feet with tapering fingers and a narrow foot. Dr Mowat claimed that the woman in the grave was around five foot to five foot three throughout her life, and he confirmed that her head had been severed from her body. This narrowed down the possibility of those who were executed in the tower to that of Margaret Pole, Catherine Howard, Lady Jane Grey, Jane Boleyn. He said that the neck of the woman was characteristically small, which is in keeping with what he knew about Anne Boleyn and her proportions, but the record of burials, which had also been recorded centuries ago, noted also that Anne had been buried roughly in this area. Her body was then taken away, and it was held inside of the Queen's house, inside the tower, being stored in a new coffin, a lead box and a container. All of her bones and remains were placed in this, and for five months they were inside of the Queen's house, until the day came to then bury her inside of a new grave and a burial site back inside of the chapel. On the 13th of April, at around midday, there were seven men, including the chaplain of the chapel, gathered to witness the reburial of Anne Boleyn. The bodies along with Anne's had been identified and these were also buried in new locations beneath the altar. The men watched as the boxes were buried around four inches below the surface and as careful note was taken as to who was buried where. On top where Anne was interred today is a marble decorative tile that marks where she's laid to rest and she's buried between her brother George and also Edward Seymour, the Lord Protector of King Edward VI. The men that discovered the bones of Anne Boleyn had uncovered a 300-year mystery as to where the most controversial wife of King Henry VIII had been buried. The doctor of Queen Victoria was certain that this was Anne, and still today she's buried in the same location. Her coffin had disintegrated and rotted over time, and she was not allowed a proper coffin, one which would have been lead-lined, as she was a queen but her remains were instead unceremoniously stuffed inside of a repackaged oak box. This was a disgrace for such an important queen who today is considered a victim of her husband, King Henry VIII. Jane Seymour was a queen who was not as highly educated as the other wives of Henry VIII, but she is considered his most beloved Jane was a peaceful and gentle woman who was seen as a good match for Henry VIII, who could rage very much. But Henry and Jane were betrothed to each other on the 20th of May, 1536, a day following the execution of Anne Boleyn. Jane and Henry had been seeing each other behind the back of the king's second wife, Anne Boleyn, and the pair married on the 30th of May, 1536, and Jane was a very different queen as to the other women. She was not crowned because of the plague in London, however Jane was a strict and formal woman and she did not lead an extravagant household which brought balance to the Tudor royal court. She was close with Henry's stepdaughters, but Jane did suffer a tragic miscarriage in the Christmas of 1536. 
However, when she fell pregnant again with the king's child, it would be everything Henry VIII wanted. During her pregnancy, Henry VIII pulled out all the stops for her, and she lived a very quiet life during her latter pregnancy before she entered her confinement in the September of 1537. But Jane gave birth to the male heir, Edward VI, at two o'clock in the morning on the 12th of October 1537, inside of Hampton Court Palace. Edward was christened three days later, and Jane was not there. But Edward VI was the legitimate son of Henry VIII, and he was so wanted. However, Jane's labour had been very tricky and difficult. It was very long, and it lasted two days and three nights, due to the positioning of the baby. But following Edward's birth and christening, it was then clear that Jane was not very well at all. Inside of Hampton Court Palace, in the very bedchamber that she gave birth to the next Tudor king, Jane Seymour died on the 24th of October 1537. There were differing causes of her death, including an infection caused from her placenta, or that she may have suffered childbed fever, which was sustained after an infection following giving birth. Others have said that she died from a pulmonary embolism, and Henry VIII was devastated by her death, and he went to Windsor, and the court were mourning clothes, and the king also spent a while in mourning. Henry did not have much involvement in sorting out the funeral proceedings, but he chose that she would be buried inside of Windsor Castle St George's Chapel. This was an indication of the king's grief, as he usually involved himself in planning huge ceremonies. On the 25th of October, Jane Seymour's corpse was embalmed and eviscerated. Her entrails were removed from her body, including her heart, and her heart was actually buried away from her body, and was placed under the altar of Hampton Court Palace's Chapel Royal. She laid in state inside of Hampton Court's presence chamber, and her remains were then laid in a lead-lined oak coffin. On the 10th of November, the funeral procession arrived at Windsor at 11 o'clock, and they were greeted at the entrance by the Dean of St George's Chapel and others. Six pallbearers carried the body inside, and they were met at the high altar by the Archbishop Thomas Cranmer. There were many prayers then made, and the body lay in state whilst the future Queen Mary I kept vigil over it. The following day, further masses were sung, and on the 12th of November a huge ceremony was held to lay the Queen to rest with full honours in a burial vault beneath the Garter Chapel, which had been made for her. This burial vault was very small and would not be very big compared to others inside of Westminster Abbey, where royals were held. Following the funeral ceremony, the Queen's officers placed their broken staves of office inside of her grave, and the bells of London tolled for six hours. The burial process took an hour, as the vault was then sealed. The period of mourning for court came to an end on February 3rd, 1538, with the king confirming this. However, nine years later, Henry VIII would also be buried inside of this small vault. When Henry VIII died, there was space inside of the vault for Henry, who had a much larger coffin than Jane's. Hers was dainty and small. It was never planned for Henry VIII and Jane Seymour to lay together at rest for long in the burial vault. There was no tomb or grave marker, but Henry VIII left instructions for he and Jane to be buried in a grand monument and tomb, presumably to be placed inside of Westminster Abbey. However, over the next few centuries, their burial vault would be broken into a number of times. The first time it was disturbed was following the execution of King Charles I in 1649. Charles had lost his head following his trial and the loss of the English Civil War, and because of the worry across England that his remains would be dug up and venerated, Parliament made the decision to bury him inside of the same quiet and small vault as Henry VIII and Jane Seymour. Because of this, the vault lid was lifted, and Henry VIII's coffin was moved, and this broke the trestle it was resting upon, so that Charles could be placed next to Henry. This was a Stuart king being buried next to a king that very much hated the Stuarts, and banned them from ever becoming kings and queens of England. But during the burial of Charles, it was noted that Henry's coffin, which was much larger, was in a bad state, 
and much of the exterior wood was broken into, and some witnesses claimed that they could even see into the coffin and could see the beard hairs on his face which had been exposed to the elements. However, Jane's coffin was said to have been in a perfect state, and something that looked as fresh as the day it left the carpenter's workshop being made for a queen. There was no sign of damage on this and no breakages. It was laying peacefully where it was buried over a century before. However, this was not the end of the breaking into the burial vault, as a child of Queen Anne, another Stuart monarch, was buried inside of the vault at the feet of Jane and Henry for some reason. So the burial vault was now very crowded, especially as it was only ever meant to house two people for a short period of time. But the final time the vault containing Jane Seymour's remains would be broken into was 1813. There was work being done to the chapel, and a passage was being made for priests to access the new royal vault. The old vault containing Jane and Henry was broken into, and it was witnessed by Regent George, the future King George VI, as well as other officials. They were looking to confirm whether Charles I's remains were inside of the coffin, and they did this by lifting his coffin and then also looking at the remains. They confirmed the damage to Henry's coffin, and it's believed that no repair work was ever carried out on this. However, Jane Seymour's coffin, around 300 years after she was buried, was still in a remarkable condition, compared to the other burials in the vault. And there was still no breaking of the wooden shell, and it still remained on the trestle, and this had not collapsed. Because of the state of preservation and also the fact that Jane would have had her body wrapped in seer cloth, a thick wax covered cloth that preserved bodies very well, it's fair to reach the conclusion that Jane Seymour's corpse could still today be in a very good state and it may not have decayed almost 500 years on. This is remarkable considering she was the ill-fated wife of King Henry VIII. Jane Seymour though was a woman who was very different to the other queens and wives of Henry VIII. She was a calm and gentle soul, but a woman who did not opt for the frivolity of being a queen. She was practical, and she gave the king his male heir that he greatly wanted. It's not been recorded that specifically Jane's coffin was ever opened, however it is noted that it was in very good state. But her burial vault was disturbed a number of times, and today it is marked with a simple engraved stone slab saying that she is buried next to her husband, the most notorious king of England. Henry VIII. On the 16th of July 1557, Anne of Cleves, the fourth wife of King Henry VIII, succumbed to an illness which lasted for a number of months, and many historians have debated that she died from cancer. In her final days, she made her will and stipulated what should happen to her wealth and household when she passed. She made sure that the members of her household and servants that she liked would be rewarded and looked after financially after her death, and she left money for them to be given payment. Anne would also leave some jewels that she had been given from Henry VIII to Mary I, and also Princess Elizabeth, the soon-to-be Queen Elizabeth I. She was a very generous woman, and she also asked for the princess and queen to employ some of her servants inside of their own households following her death so that they would not be without a job. But Anne was very kind, and she was a woman who never had the chance to show her great qualities as a queen. But it was noted that she was very nice, and during her marriage to King Henry VIII, the king didn't value her beauty or appearance, but he did enjoy her company and gentle nature. She was a woman who had been given a lot of financial gain in the settlement following her annulment with Henry VIII, and she was awarded a large number of houses and residences. She was given Richmond Palace to live in, but inside one of these homes, Chelsea Manor, Anne of Cleves died. She passed away a year before Queen Mary I did, and before Elizabeth I came onto the throne. If she'd lived longer, it's possible she may have held a position at court. But Anne, following her death, was allowed to be buried inside of Westminster Abbey, and she was the only one of Henry VIII's wives who was given this honour. She was to be buried close to where the founders of the Tudor dynasty were buried in their vault, Henry VII and Elizabeth of York, the mother and father of Henry VIII. She was given a large funeral, and it was said she was a queen and a European princess, it was said of her funeral that 
On the third day of August, my lady Anne of Cleves, sometime wife to Henry VIII, came from Chelsea to be buried in Westminster. With all the children of Westminster and many priests and clerks, and the monks of Westminster, and my Lord Bishop of London, and my Lord Abbot of Westminster rode together. Many of the prominent politicians of the time attended, and there were one hundred torches burning that were carried by her servants. The funeral procession was large and massive, and it was then taken to Westminster Abbey, where her tomb had been prepared and her coffin was then placed into this. Her body was also interred with a cloth of gold laid over her, and following this the officers of her household broke their staves of office, symbolising their duty was over and done with, and then they threw these into the tomb. Her funeral had been conducted according to the Catholic faith, and she was given the Catholic rites that she wished for, and was buried inside of a tomb on the south side of the high altar. Today, during the coronation of monarchs, Anne's tomb can be seen close to the proceedings, and her monument is a low stone structure split into three sections. On it, it has ornate carvings displaying the initials AC, featuring a crown, a lion's head, and a skull and crossbones on it. It is considered that the tomb was made by a man from her native lands, Theodore Halves of Cleves. However, this was never finished, and the final touches to her burial monument never took place. It is assumed that Anne was buried inside of this tomb, and that it has never really been opened. The tomb today is very easy to miss, and it's not easy to spot inside of Westminster Abbey. You would expect that a wife of Henry VIII would have a large tomb, which would have a number of Tudor symbols on it. However, this is what can be seen on the tomb and coffin of Henry VIII. Mary, Queen of Scots, also had a huge effigy on her tomb, but the tomb of Anne of Cleves is actually found in the peaceful sanctuary area, which is one of the most serious religious parts of the abbey, and as mentioned, the coronation ceremony occurs in this part of the abbey. Part of her tomb can be seen from behind, and this shows the inscription, Anne of Cleves, Queen of England, born 1515, died 1557, and it can be read from standing in the transept. But this area is usually off limits to the public due to its religious importance and as a place where the coronation takes place, meaning that today her tomb is not accessible and it has been lost. Also, what doesn't help is the fact that many other tombs and memorials to different people obscure and hide the tomb of Anne of Cleves. It is also opposite Edward the Confessor's tomb and is overshadowed because of his importance in the abbey. Anne of Cleves was buried within the same walls as her father and mother-in-law. Yes, she never met them, but she is also buried close to her two stepdaughters, her beloved Mary I and Elizabeth I. However, during the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II, the tomb of Anne of Cleves was actually built over and overshadowed by a temporary platform that would allow the Queen Mother to witness and view the coronation of her daughter, and she sat on this stand above Anne of Cleves' tomb. This means her tomb was temporarily hidden yet again, and when we personally visited Westminster Abbey, despite much searching, we could not locate the tomb of Anne of Cleves. She was the Queen of England, who benefited greatly from her divorce agreement between her and Henry VIII, and she remained inside of England to live comfortably for the rest of her life, following the death of Henry VIII. However, Anne could have returned home to Germany, and despite being Queen for just a matter of months, she was buried inside the heart of England's Christian worship, and inside a church where many other Tudor queens and important figures would be buried. Her tomb inside of Westminster is very easy to miss, and it shows how important she was, and how well thought of she was. Catherine Howard and King Henry VIII married on the 28th of July 1540, and she was a carefree young woman who probably did not realise what she was getting herself into. Her early life had been considered to have been marked with rumours of scandal, However, during the marriage to the king, Catherine grew closer to the king's favourite courtier, Thomas Culpepper, and it was said that Culpepper had succeeded in the affections of the queen at the expense of the king. 
Some historians have considered that Culpepper may have wanted to marry Catherine Howard before Henry got involved, but the pair, by the spring of 1541, were now meeting in secret, and during these meetings it's believed that things were physical between the two. These meetings were overseen by Jane Boleyn, one of the ladies-in-waiting for Catherine, and rumours emerged at court about this, and things were not kept a secret. The questions about Catherine's earlier behaviour with men also continued with regards to what happened while she was in the care of Agnes Tilney, the Duchess of Norfolk. It's believed she had intimate relations with others before she became the king's wife, and this would have therefore invalidated their marriage. Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury, was dispatched to investigate, and he then brought the allegations to the mind of the king, and the evidence against Catherine was compelling. A love letter was even produced which had been written by her to Culpepper. On the 23rd of November 1531, Catherine Howard was stripped of the title of Queen, and she was then imprisoned before being condemned to death. Thomas Culpepper was executed by beheading, alongside another man, Francis Deerham, who it was believed had a pre-contract of marriage with Catherine Howard. And he was hanged, drawn and quartered. Both of these had their heads taken off and they were placed high on spikes above London Bridge before Catherine was then taken to the Tower of London for her final days and Catherine screamed as she passed by the heads of her former lovers. On the evening of the 12th of February 1542, whilst she was housed inside of the Tower of London, Catherine was told she would be executed the next morning, and she was told to prepare for her execution. The next morning, she was to be executed by axe, and by the commoner's axe, but she was allowed a private execution befitting her status as the king's wife. She was said to have had the block brought to her chambers so she could practice late into the night as how to lay her head upon it so the executioner could perform her death quickly and swiftly without any need for more than one swing. On the morning of the 13th of February 1542, Catherine emerged from her chambers in front of a number of councillors, ambassadors and lords who had been gathered to witness the proceedings and it was said that she was helped to the scaffold as she was so weak, an eyewitness claimed. The Queen was so weak that she could hardly speak, but confessed in few words that she had merited a hundred deaths for so offending the King, who had so graciously treated her. Another witness said how the Queen had made the most godly and Christian end and asked all Christian people to take regard under her worthy and just punishment with death, for her offences against God and heinously from her youth upward in breaking all of his commandments and also against the king's royal majesty very dangerously. While she was on the scaffold, she apologised for her crimes and then knelt down at the executioner's block in the manner that she had practised in the night. The executioner then stood with his axe and he swung the weapon down quickly, and in one swift strike Catherine's head was taken clean off. She was not given a swordsman for the job, and she died by the commoner's axe in the way someone could be if they were spared hanging, drawing and quartering for treason. After her death, a number of women, and it's believed ladies-in-waiting to Catherine Howard, or those who had come to care for her on the scaffold, they collected her body and her head and wrapped them in a black cloth. It's possible that they collected these inside of a wooden box or that they may have just simply wrapped her remains in the cloth to be taken into the chapel of St Peter ad Vincula, the tower's chapel next to the scaffold. It was here where Anne Boleyn, Henry VIII's second wife and many other high-ranking Tudor officials were buried and those also lost their heads on Tower Hill were brought into the tower's walls to be interred inside of this chapel. But the burial of Catherine Howard was horrific. She was buried by her ladies, but it could have been John Gage, the constable of the Tower of London, who was in charge of the execution and subsequent burial of the prisoner in the tower's chapel. 
Anne Boleyn, during her burial, was placed in an oak chest, but this is not known for Catherine Howard, and she may have just been dumped into a shallow grave, with little or no coffin. There were then claims made that those who were overseeing the burial then poured a large amount of quicklime onto the body of Catherine Howard in her grave, and the effects of this was to make her remains decay a lot quicker, so that Catherine Howard would literally be wiped off the face of the earth. Her remains would have dissolved quickly, and it was a sign of Henry VIII ridding himself of the disastrous fifth wife he had in the form of Catherine Howard. He was disregarding her, almost like trash. However, the woman who attended on her would not have been the ones who did this, and they did not have quicklime on them, so this would have been organised by the Constable of the Tower of London, and it's considered that Henry VIII ordered this request himself to make it seem like Catherine had never once set foot upon the earth. Quicklime as a substance was used for centuries with burials, and was even placed in plague pits centuries before to quicken decay and to try and kill deadly diseases but it led to Catherine Howard's remains being treated awfully, but this would not be the end of the story. Three hundred years later, during the reign of Queen Victoria, visitors to the Tower of London's chapel had remarked how it was not a place fit for the burial of queens and royals as it had fallen into a state of disrepair. One visitor stated, I cannot refrain from expressing my disgust at the barbarous stupidity which has transformed this interesting little church into the likeness of a meeting house in a manufacturing town. In truth, there is no sadder spot on earth than this little cemetery. But in 1875, a proposal was submitted to restore the chapel of St Peter at Vincula and to make it a place fit for a royal burial. However, during the works, the chapel's floor was removed and the remains of high-ranking Tudor figures, including Anne Boleyn and others, who were executed, were discovered. Queen Victoria then sanctioned the removal of the victims of the Tower of London and also Tower Hill, and she said that the greatest care and reverence should be exercised in this removal and that a careful record should be kept of every sign of possible identification which might come to light. The workers found Anne Boleyn's remains, and the Queen's doctor came in to look at her remains, and he stated to them that, At this depth the bones of a female were found, not lying in the original order, but which had evidently, for some reason or other, been heaped together into a smaller space. All these bones were examined by Dr Mowat, who had once pronounced those to be of a female, between twenty-five and thirty years of age of a delicate frame of body, and who had been of slender and perfect proportions. The forehead and lower jaw were small and especially well formed. However, the search was on to find the remains of Catherine Howard, Henry's fifth wife. It was known for certain that Catherine was buried inside of the chapel, and there were even some questions raised that the body of Anne Boleyn may have even been Catherine. But despite searching as hard as they could, no remains were found that could be tracked back to Catherine Howard. There were many questions as to what had happened to her body and remains, and some theories offer explanation. The first is that the quick lime over the centuries did its job quicker than it was believed, as Henry VIII intended, and Catherine Howard was literally wiped off the earth, with her body being dissolved in the substance. Another belief is that Catherine was so young at the time of her execution that her bones had not yet consolidated and gone hard and that they decayed quicker than they would have done if she was older. There were two skeletons found in a south-east direction near to the wall of the chapel and the investigators hoped that one of these may be Catherine. One of these was much smaller than the other. However, after analysing the bones, it was discovered that these remains belonged to Jane Boleyn, Lady Rochford, who was executed after Catherine on the same scaffold and was forced to kneel in her blood, and the other skeleton belonged to Margaret Pole, the Countess of Salisbury. These two women were both victims of the Tower of London and King Henry VIII. It would have made sense for Catherine Howard to be buried close to Jane Boleyn, as one pit could have been dug for them both, but the remains found were not Catherine's. 
the only possible remains that could have belonged to the fifth wife of Henry VIII, were found close to Margaret Pole, and these were a collection of bones that had been heavily eroded and decayed using lime, which does fit the story. But the story of Henry VIII's fifth wife is a horrific one, and she may have just been a teenager when she lost her head inside the Tower of London at the hands of an axeman. But today her bones and remains may still lie under the chapel's floor undiscovered. Catherine Parr was believed at the time of the Tudor period to have been a too radical Protestant, and many inside of Henry VIII's government believed she was leading the king down a path of more ruthless religious changes, and she was not the most popular woman. She was a woman who had married before, and Henry's final wife was very different to his other wives, and she was more of a scholar than a doting wife. She married Henry VIII inside of Hampton Court Palace on the 12th of July 1543, and was made the first Queen of England, who was also made the Queen of Ireland. She was the Queen up until Henry's death, and she had throughout her life even acted as the regent whilst the king was away in France. She involved herself in educating the future Elizabeth I. However, after the king's death, Catherine Parr fell in love again with Thomas Seymour, the first Baron Seymour of Sudley, and he was sniffing around for more power. The pair had a long history together, and Seymour saw his opportunity to marry the new Dowager Queen as a way of getting closer to the throne. His brother, Edward Seymour, was made the Lord Protector of Edward VI and the Chair of the Boy King's Regency Council, and Thomas Seymour was very jealous about this. Edward Seymour was now acting almost as a king. However, Catherine Parr and Thomas married in secret, but when the information about this came to light, there was a huge scandal. Catherine's actions in accepting marriage so shortly after Henry's death were seen as shameful and disgraceful, and Edward VI was not impressed with this, and Catherine then joined forces with her new husband to take on Edward Seymour. However, despite never being pregnant before or having any children, she became pregnant with Seymour's child, and at the time, childbirth during the 16th century was incredibly risky. It could be a death sentence for a woman, and Catherine's risk was heightened as she was slightly older. Complications could have been fatal. At the time, she was living inside her husband's castle, Sudley, and she continued to help educate Lady Jane Grey, the nine-day queen, whilst being pregnant. But then she entered her bedchambers to give birth to a daughter, who arrived on the 30th of August, 1548. But Catherine Parr never recovered from childbirth, and on the 5th of September, she died inside of her rooms days after giving birth. After her death, Thomas Seymour left his castle, and the funeral was arranged, and it would become historic, as it was the first fully Protestant service to occur across England. The chief mourner was Lady Jane Grey, and Catherine's body was embalmed inside of her bedroom by physicians, and it was then taken inside of the chapel, St Mary's Chapel, next to the castle, and she was prepared for burial. She was to be buried in a huge ornate tomb that was made for her, and was then placed on the north side of the chapel, and on this tomb was an effigy of Catherine, and it had a Latin inscription on the bottom of it. However, Catherine Parr's remains were disturbed many times over the following years, and her coffin was shockingly broken into. In 1642, the tomb of Henry VIII's sixth wife was destroyed during the English Civil War, as roundhead forces of Parliament's army smashed up the chapel and desecrated her monument as she stood for monarchy. However, her body was also disturbed, and the grave was smashed to pieces and dug up, and it was said that... There is in the castle a godly fair church. Here they dug up the graves and disturbed the ashes of the death. They break down the monuments. However, in 1782, a number of people arrived at Sudley and a group of ladies who had an interest in history wanted to find the remains and tomb of Catherine Parr. Inside of the chapel, they found a block of alabaster marble in the north wall from her tomb, and some men dug underneath it and they came across the lead-lined coffin of Henry VIII's sixth wife. These group of people then opened the coffin, 
And what they found was remarkable. They found Catherine Parr's body wrapped tightly in a sear cloth, a heavy wax dipped in cloth which had been almost mummifying her to preserve her. They saw her face for the first time in two centuries. However, as her corpse was exposed to the air for the first time, the colour of Catherine's face drained and her eyes turned a different colour and lost their sparkle. The women then asked the men, after their curious outing, to rebury her body inside of the coffin. But a local farmer found out about what had happened inside of the church nearby, and he tried to inspect the body of Henry VIII's sixth wife himself. It was said that, In the summer of the year 1782, the earth in which Q.K. Parr lay interred was removed at the depth of about two feet, or very little more, her leaden coffin, or coffin, was found quite whole. Mr Lucas had the curiosity to rip up the top of the coffin, expecting to discover within it only the bones of the deceased. But to his great surprise, he found the whole body wrapped in six or seven sear cloth linen, entire and uncorrupted. His unwarranted curiosity led him to make an incision through the sear cloth, which covered one of the arms of the corpse, and the flesh of which what the time was white and moist. He made an incision and uncovered one of the arms, and he said that the flesh was white and moist, and he also cut off a few locks of the Queen's hair, as well as some material from her cloth and dress which was buried in. In 1783, just a year later, the steward of the castle then directed for the grave to be opened again to see the Queen's remains. And it was said that the body had begun to decay quickly, it was also noted that the shoes were on the feet which were very small and that the Queen's proportions were extremely delicate and that her hair was gold. Four years later, the coffin of Catherine Parr was yet again opened. This time it was a curious local priest who wanted to see the state of her body and he had found that the head of Catherine had totally decayed and presumably no skin was left. He also found that teeth had fallen out of her mouth or may have been pulled out by those hungry to take a souvenir of a wife of Henry VIII. However, he also found when inspecting the remains that her hands and arm had turned brown and he made a short sketch of what he saw in her body. He then covered up the body, but six years later, one of the most shocking parts of Catherine's desecration occurred. A group of drunk vandals entered the chapel and they then disinterred Catherine Parr out of the coffin and messed around with it, and one man even danced with the corpse of Catherine Parr. They then dumped the body of her in the corner in a pile, making off with some more teeth, and one man allegedly even stabbed an iron bar through the torso of Henry VIII's final queen, and then had buried this in the ground upside down. Hearing of this, a local priest then appealed to Queen Victoria to give Catherine Parr a better and deserved burial in a final monument where she could finally be laid to rest after centuries of desecration. It was agreed that Catherine would be buried inside of a new coffin and a new tomb which was made from stone and she was interred in safety. When the time came to rebury her inside of the newly renovated church within the grounds of the castle where she died, it was found that Catherine's body was just a pile of bones now, with a smaller part of flesh and hair on her body. But she was then buried inside of this new tomb where she still lies today, in decency. The horrific story of those people who opened the coffin of Catherine Parr were a mix of criminals and curious. And she was in death not given the respect that she deserved, but she is a woman who is considered a survivor of the brutal reign of Henry VIII, but she could have experienced execution herself. But what happened to her coffin over the centuries was shocking and barbaric. Thank you for watching, and to support, please subscribe to Her Remarkable History. Thank you.